tonight's scripture is from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Now Naaman was commander of the armies of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, Wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. This is the word of the Lord. Yeah, when you rev up after the summer in September, you kind of look at your goals again, your aims, you know, what you're really about, sort of reacquire them. And what Redeemer is about, more than anything else, is the idea that the gospel can change anything, anyone. And this story, this unique story, actually, as we'll see in the Bible, we're going to look at for an extended period of time, a couple of weeks, to see how that works. Naaman was a Aramean. He was a Syrian. He was the general of Syria. And um, Syria and Israel, as you can see from here, and as we will see over these next couple of weeks, were mortal bitter enemies. And for Naaman to be going to Israel to seek the God of Israel, especially since, by the way, Israel was losing right now in the, in the military uh, uh, conflict, and therefore, uh, th th why a Syrian general would think that the losing country's God would have anything for him, is, it's very unlikely, and yet we see here that the Syrian general goes to the God of Israel for help, and it's shocking. It's unprecedented, and it's every bit as shocking as if you'd heard, if you've heard the rumor that some utterly secular, brilliant, famous Manhattan power broker was secretly sneaking into the back of Redeemer Church to listen to his sermons every week. And if you heard that, you say, what? And, and the point is, Naaman's like the average person who lives in Manhattan, very pulled together, uh, the most unlikely person in the world, people in the world, to be seeking uh, the God of the Bible. But it does happen. Uh, 25 years ago, when Kathy and I were first coming here to sort of check out this New York, New York City, the center of New York City for a church, uh, people said, people in Manhattan do not go to church. They are pulled together, accomplished. They've been there, done that with religion in general, certainly Christianity. Nobody's going to come. Nobody's seeking God in Manhattan, as you know that even though it's true that nobody wants you to know that they're seeking, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of secret seeking going on, a lot of clandestine seeking going on. So my question is, what makes a person like Naaman, what makes the average Manhattanite into someone who seeks 
the biblical God. That's what we're looking at. So let's ask these three questions. Why do people seek him, the God of the Bible? How do people find him? And why can they seek and find him? Why we seek him, how we find him, and why we can seek and find him. So first of all, why we seek him. What turns a person, even an accomplished, pulled-together person like Naaman, into a seeker? And it's two factors, and they've got to both be there. The first factor is there has to be something that happens in your life to show you that self-sufficiency is a lie. Self-sufficiency is a lie. It starts right here in verse 1, and verse 1 actually is, in Hebrew, is one long sentence, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's good literary art. It's artful. Here's why. The sentence goes through all the things that Naaman's got. Commander, field marshal of the army of the king of Syria, great man, not only in the sight of his master, but highly regarded by the people, so popular, um, had gotten victory. He wasn't just the general, but he was a victorious general, valiant soldier. He had military prowess. He had skill in battle. He must have had athletic and kind of physical prowess. He had absolutely everything. And then suddenly it says, but he had leprosy. But wasting terrible disease, leprosy. So what's the point? Here's the first point. No matter how much, no matter how well you have created a designer life, no matter how well you have done at creating a designer life, or even no matter how much you think you can create a designer life, there will always be something that will come in and ruin it. Always. There's always a but he had but it happened. Now, for example, it could come from the outside. Look, bereavement, people that you love dying, dire illness, relational betrayal, stab in the back, financial reversal. No amount of success, no amount of uh, power, no amount of achievement, no amount of savviness, no Nothing can keep those things from happening to you. In fact, they will happen to you. And when they do, even the people who seem the most self-sufficient, the most pulled together, the most like they can handle life, they'll find themselves out of their depth. Because you'll know at that point that it's not, not just that at that spot, at that moment you're out of control of your life and you never thought that would happen to you, but the fact is you'll realize you are always out of control your life is fragile. You're vulnerable to all sorts of forces. And you're blind to it until something comes in and destroys the illusion of self-sufficiency. It might come from inside, not just outside. You know, leprosy is a word that actually it can refer to a lot of different skin diseases. And there are some diseases that destroy you that are under the heading of leprosy that aren't something you catch from outside, but they're genetic. They, they're, they're from, there's something wrong inside that just comes out. And that's a fascinating metaphor or image for what the Bible says, what's wrong with the heart. In every one of us, there is something really bad that we kind of know about, but we kind of minimize too. Or we might even be in complete denial. I just, for example, um, some of you are deeply anxious because you feel like imposters and you feel like pretenders and you don't want anybody to know about it. Some of you are really resentful in general You've got a sense of grievance. You've got a sense that nobody's doing what they should do and everybody's a jerk and why the, I've been mis, uh, misused here and here and here. And there's just, a, there's just a, a level of grumpiness and anger and cantankerousness in you. Some of you have a, a different issue and that is that you're very proud and stubborn. You're wise in your own eyes. You do not take advice. You kind of know it. Some of you have got some addiction that you kind of know is an addiction, but maybe it's not exactly an addiction. These things will at some point rise up because they're much worse than you think, and we've all got something like that in our lives, and ruin what you've got. See, it doesn't matter what kind of wonderful life you think you can put together, something will ruin it. And at that moment, you will know that you are not actually self-sufficient. This is the reason why 
most people are like Naaman, that they don't start seeking God until something actually goes wrong in their lives. You know why? Because there's nothing else that wakes us up from the metaphysical illusion and dream of self-sufficiency and the, th and the idea that we really, all by ourselves, spiritually all by ourselves, we can pretty much handle life. That's a lie. And until you see that, you won't start seeking. But that's not all. That's only one of the two factors that make you a seeker. Because there's plenty of people, by the way, who have all these troubles. Things come into their lives and they don't seek the biblical God. So there's another factor, and that other factor is this. You also have to come to see that the world cannot help you. That what the world's got cannot help you. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, what did Naaman have? He had three things, for sure. He had connections to the people at the top. And he knew the king and all, probably everybody else that was anybody in Syria. He had connections to people at the top. Uh, secondly, he had money, lots of money, as, you can, as we will see. <clears throat> uh, and he had power in the sense of expertise and prowess and skill. And these are the things that the world can give you. But it didn't help him. It wasn't enough for him to deal with his problem. He had a huge problem, and what the world gave him in Syria wasn't working. When he hears that there's someone in, New, in, in, uh, in Israel with the power to cure him, how does he go? What does he do? He goes from one king to another king. He goes down to the king of Israel, and what does he take with him? Three things. One is a letter from the king of Syria. See, that's connections. I know people. Secondly, he takes an enormous amount of money. And by the way, all the commentaries go in to say, what, what is 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing in you know, current, um, you know, currency? And the answer is they all say something different, and it was a lot. It was a whole lot. You know, it would be what you would call you know, a mega billionaire kind of person. So he has money, he's got connections, and, and here's the most important thing, even though it, it, we'll get to it in a minute, down in verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? He expected to be asked to do some great deed, to, to do something, maybe help people, or maybe do something benevolent, or do some great deed, you know, Lancelot, moral purity, you know, uh, fight some battle or something like that in order to earn his cure. So he had, he had looked to the world connections to the top, money and power, in Syria, and it hadn't helped him. So now he came to Israel, and he's actually looking to the same things. But what he has to learn, and he does learn, is the world can't help him. And until you see the world can't help you, you can't make any kind of spiritual progress. Now, the first person that begins to show him this is a very distressed king of Israel. <laughs> Because what the king says, as soon as the king of Israel, verse 7, read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? He's trying to pick a quarrel with me. Now, uh, the most immediate problem that the, is, the, the king of Israel has is this might touch off an international incident and we have another battle or another war. But the real problem is the king of Israel knows that Naaman does not understand anything about this God of Israel. We have to be really nice to Naaman. I mean, let's not be hard on him. In fact, as I'm going to today and to next, you know, we, you know, when we talk about this, Naaman is a great guy. He's an excellent man in virtually every way. And one of the things we have to see is what he's doing here is he's just simply expecting, as we ought to imagine, he's expecting that the, that the God of Israel and the religion of Israel would function the way all other religions and all other nations function. All other nations had a god and temples and priests and that sort of thing, but their religion and their god was essentially an extension of the nation itself, a deification of the nation itself, and therefore the religion was always, among other things, a mode of social control. And the priests and the cult, cultists and all the trappings in the temple was all employed by the king, and they all supported the king, and they all supported the, the monarchy. And so the reason why... Naaman hears about a prophet in Israel that can cure him, and he goes to the king. Why does he go to the king of Israel? Because he assumed the king was the employer of the prophet. Everywhere else in the world, that's how it was done. If you had priests and sages and, 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 and prophets and that sort of thing, they were, they were in, under the employee of the king, so he went to the top. He just said, you know, I hear you've got somebody in your employee that, you know, can cure me of leprosy. And so here, and what does he bring? 
every other religion in the world because basically the god was an extension of the culture, an extension of the nation in the service of the king and the monarchy. Uh, in every other religion in the world, if you got your blessing from the god, you got it with resources. You could pay for it. Uh, the most valiant, the most moral, the most resourced, the most powerful, the most wealthy people, they're the ones who got the blessings of the God. Now, I want you to know that we live in a time in which, in most Western societies, that's what you're, you're going to be taught right now, that very view in most universities. Today, the view is that religion is just an extension of culture. It's just an extension of culture. So you go to the Middle East, the Arab people, of course, they're Muslim. It's part of their culture. You go to India, they're Hindu. It's part of their culture. In America, you could be Jewish or Christian or maybe not, but it's whatever it is, it's just part of your culture, part of your, who, you know, your cultural identity. The idea of a transcendent God, a God who has his own reality, who's not an extension of culture, is just not even thought of. So today is very much the same. And therefore, how do we decide we're going to deal with our problems? How are we going to deal with poverty and disease? And how are we going to deal with, with war and racism and violence and, and the breakdown of our, of our families and psychological breakdown? How are, we going, how are we going to deal with our biggest problems? We go to the top. Blue ribbon commissions. Top managers. Top sociologists, psychologists. Top technology. We go to the world to deal with the biggest problems of, that we possibly have because we figure that's the only place to go. We're just like Naaman. But when the king of Israel <laughs> tears his robes, he tears his robes when he says, am I God that I can kill and make a lie? Here's what he's trying to say. You've come to the one place in the world where the prophets are not on a string and where the God is real. The God is transcendent. The God doesn't do what I tell him to God to do or what the prophets don't do what I tell him. Because our God is not a projection of our culture or of our hearts. He's a judge of our culture and our hearts. He's independent. I have nothing that I can possibly do to make him do anything. Becky Pippert, some years ago, uh, uh, wrote a book called Hope Has Its Reasons and tells about how the fact she, some years ago she was auditing courses in counseling at uh, Harvard University. And she was in one course in which uh, she, uh, the professor was doing a case study of how bitterness and anger can really distort your life. And it was a case study about a particular man um, who hated his mother. And because he hated his mother, he had distorted his life in all sorts of ways. And there was this wonderful diagnosis, and there was this wonderful uh, description of how it can be done, and everybody thought it was really fascinating. And then Becky uh, raised her hand and said, okay, now let's just say the therapist has shown his client, all this about himself. He said, and then he says, how then do you help the man as a therapist forgive his mother? I mean, what if the man said to his therapist, thank you for showing me how angry I am. Now, how do I forgive her? And so what if you were asked that? And the professor looked at Becky and said, well, I think the therapist probably should say lots of luck. And, of course, all the students got upset and said, well, wait a minute, can't you help? Surely your therapist, he says, help me forgive my mother. Surely you can help. And, you know, the, the professor rightly just kept shaking his head. And he says, now you're into areas of morality and value. Forgiveness is a matter of right and wrong. We're talking about science. We're talking about, you know, I can tell you about family dynamics and emotional dynamics and that sort of thing, but as soon as you get into an area like this about what is right and what is wrong and whether it's right to forgive or not or how you do it. He says, you're in the area of faith and morals and values. You're kind of in a religious area. And he looked at, every, at the, the whole class and says, quote, if you are looking for a changed heart, you're in the wrong department. He's right. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, am I God? Don't you dare look to the world to give you what only God can give you. If only the political leaders the therapists, the professors of the world are willing to say, hey, we can do things, yes. But we can't give what only God can give. Until you see that the world cannot help you, you'll never be a seeker after God. Now, secondly, question, how do you then find? How does Naaman find the biblical God? And here we again have two factors, and they both are crucial. 
In fact, I'm going to call them shifts. He goes through two shifts, and you have to go through those shifts if you're going to find God. Otherwise, you'd be sort of locked into what I call a spirituality uh, cycle in which you go back and forth between getting secular and skeptical and then getting religious and, and spiritual and on and on and on forever and never really hitting pay dirt. So the first shift he goes through is this. The first shift is you have to shift from wanting help for your suffering to wanting forgiveness for your sin. Now, this shift is not as visible because we've only, in this text, though it's, it starts here, because we only have the first half of the text that we've read. We've only done verses 1 to 14. There's also verses 15 to 29, which we'll be reading and looking at next week. But what's important is even inside this text, there's something important. When Elisha, we're told when Elisha, the man of God, verse 8, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why do you, have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know what? Send him to me so he can learn what? That there is a miracle man here? That there's a magician strong enough? No. That there's a prophet He needs to learn that there's a prophet, and the prophet was essentially a preacher, a bearer of truth, someone who gave gave the word of God. So even here, the hint is what he needs is not a magic trick. He needs to hear the word of God. But the most telling thing, which maybe maybe we should have printed verse 15 and read it here because next week we're going to look at it in more depth. The first thing that happens when he comes up from his cure, he gets his cure. Yes, he does. But when he comes back, the first thing he says is this, and it's astounding, and it's unique in the Old Testament. He says, now I know that there is no God in all the world but the God of Israel. See, now, why didn't he say, now I know that your God is more powerful than my God because my God couldn't heal me of leprosy? That's, he could have said that without going through a massive revolution, radical worldview change. He could have said that, and it wouldn't have changed his worldview. It wouldn't have changed what he believed. But for him to come back and say, now I know there is no other God in all the world but this one. There's been a shift in what he believes in. There's been a shift in his relationship with God. Now, all through the Bible you have this. You know, uh, in Mark chapter 2, there's a place where four friends bring a paralyzed man to Jesus on a cot, and they bring him. He's paralyzed. And Jesus walks up to the man, and he says, my son, your sins are forgiven. And I'm pretty sure that the friends were saying, uh, that's really not the reason why we brought you, him to you. Have you noticed he's, you know, have you noticed, uh, you know, he's... Uh... That's not his most urgent need. And Jesus says, essentially, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Don't you realize that when the problems come into your life, problems come into your life. And if you say the main thing I need is help to deal with my problem, one of the reasons why the problem's so shattering is because you don't have the relationship with God you ought to have. Because you're living for yourself. Because everything's revolving around you and God only sort of brought in here or there, you know, in order to get help. And it doesn't work. It's the reason why you're so vulnerable. It's not your most fundamental problem. And unless you make that shift, from thinking of yourself as a suffering that needs help to a sinner that needs forgiveness and reconciliation with God and until you begin to see my relationship with God is more important than anything else. And he does that, which we will see more next week. That's the first shift. The second shift is actually very related and it's just as important. He also shifts from thinking he can earn his salvation and the blessing of God to understanding he has to tr- just simply trust and rest in God's free grace. Now that comes out right here. All of us believe kind of what he believed about what it will take. See, if you go down to verse 13, we already mentioned this before. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? See, he came with money, he came with connections, and he came ready to do something great to earn his blessing. See, if Elisha had come out and said, bring me the broomstick of the wicked witch of the West. He would have said, yeah, this is, that makes sense to me. All right. I mean, this is a pretty big thing, cure of leprosy. So, of course, this should be a great thing. If I'm asking for a great blessing, I should accomplish some great thing. Okay, where do I go? 
Or if he'd come out and said, I want you to slay a dragon. All right, all right, okay, give me my sword, give me my spear. This is so deep in us. Magic Flute, the great opera by Mozart. You know what the storyline is, most of it is the music so great that most of us just sort of ignore the storyline. <laughs> but you know, Tomino and Pamina have to go through all these ordeals if they're going to reach bliss, if they're going to reach salvation as it is, as it was. They have to go through fire. They have to go through water. They have to go through all these ordeals. And it's very deep in us that if we're going to be saved or get blessing, we have to, we have to earn it. We have to perform. Now, Elisha comes after and demolishes this in every possible way, this basic understanding. First of all, you notice Elisha doesn't even come out. He sends his servant, which is humiliating, and it's meant to be humiliating. It's a way of saying, the salvation of my God comes not to the proud and the great, but it comes to the humble, and I'm starting to humble you. The second thing is, Elisha doesn't do anything. Notice how upset Naaman is. It says in verse 11, I thought he would surely come out to me, of course, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over me or do something, incantation, some kind of spectacle. Elisha doesn't do that because he also doesn't want Naaman to think that the blessing of God uh, is based on the Elisha's power or strength or performance. And then he says, here's the message, you want your salvation, you want your cure, go wash in the Jordan River. Just wash seven times, just go down and dip seven times in the Jordan River. Now, why is he furious? Verse 11, he was enraged. Why? You know why he was enraged? Any idiot can do that. <laughs> Any child can do that. Any weakling can do that. Any immoral person can do that. Wow, what kind of God is this? No standards. <laughs> in other words, any priest or a prostitute could do that. It would be no difference. Any weakling or warrior can do this. There would be no difference. Any moral person or immoral, immoral person could do No difference at all. And now you see how brilliant this is. Because as we already said, the leprosy of his body got his attention. In fact, we're all like that. Something has to go wrong. We suffer, and that gets our attention, so we go to God. But when you actually get to God, if you're ever going to find God, you've got to see there's a leprosy of the soul, and the leprosy of the soul is self-righteousness. By self-righteousness, I just simply mean self-centeredness, a belief that, that everything should revolve around you. You can't know a God who is the center of everything unless you know how to orbit around him. And basically what is happening here is something has to humble him. Something has to deal with the real leprosy of his soul and our soul, self-righteousness, the desire to have everything revolve around us and orbit around us and everybody orbit around us, including God, is the reason why there's so much misery in the world. And it's the reason why we have no relationship with God. And what he's, what's happening here is Naaman, by this cure, is being shown the only way for you to earn the salvation of God is to see you can't earn it. See, if it's really true that God created you and he's sustaining your life every second, what, was, what, what do you owe a God like that? You owe it to him to live every second for him and not for yourself. Every second for him. Does anybody do that? No. Even good people do that? No. And therefore, we're, that, we're so far short from what we ought to be, the only possible salvation that we could have would be no great thing to be done. He's looking to do a great thing. Well, the great thing is beyond him. The great thing is too far. Our, our God has standards too huge for him. It has to be by grace. It has to be free, and therefore, it's for anybody. Romans 3.23, there is no difference between prostitute and priest, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And he's infuriated. He's enraged. Why is he enraged? See, the uh, servants are smart. And they say, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than this? Why? See, they understand something. It is a great thing to realize there's no great thing that you can do, but you have to receive it as a humble sinner. That is the great thing, to see there's no great thing you can do. And so over the years I've had so many people say to me, well, if that's it, that's it. It's too easy. I say, it is not too easy. It's too hard. That's why you're not doing it. It's the hardest thing in the world. It's too radical. It's too scary. It's too wonderful for you to believe it. See? And that's why you're not doing it. 
The great thing that you must do is to see you can't do any great thing. That's the thing. Now, he goes and he washes and he comes up and he's cured, more than cure. His flesh was restored because it was as clean as that of a young boy. Now, here's the question. How is it possible that this is provided for him? Let's go back to one of the things that was probably upsetting him and getting him angry. Does this God have no standards? Why do you think he actually says, wait a minute, why, why are not Abana and far, far the rivers of Damascus better than any of the waters of Israel? You know, why couldn't I go home and do this? At least my God has standards. I mean, at least the God Rimon in Syria at least demands some righteousness. This guy seems to have no standards at all. How is it possible that this would be absolutely free? Does this God have no standards? And of course, you and I know, of course, he has standards. In fact, they're so high, that's the reason why there is no great thing that he can do. There's no way he could possibly achieve it. God is absolutely holy. He's absolutely perfect. He says, I will no way, no way clear the guilty, and therefore it, he couldn't possibly have earned it. Well, then how is it provided for him? And the answer is this. The great deed was beyond him, but somebody did it. Somebody did this great deed. Somebody went through fire, not literal fire, but the fire of divine justice and divine wrath. Somebody went through water, not literal water, but an ocean of justice and wrath. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, that was the ultimate ordeal. He went there and took the punishment we deserve. There he slew the dragon of evil and sin and death, and he did the deed that Naaman, in his folly, thought he could do, but he could never have done. And that's why you and me and Naaman can just wash. It takes no moral record. It takes no ability just to receive it. It only takes the willingness to admit that you need something this free. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It doesn't matter, my dear friends, it does not matter what the running sore of your soul is. It doesn't matter what your problem is. It doesn't matter what is getting you down and ruining your life. There is a cure for it, and there's only one cure for it, and it's here. And the little servant girl that we'll talk about next week, the little slave girl, she was a slave, an Israelite slave in Naaman's household, the wrong race, just a slave, despised, and yet she had the truth. She pointed to the prophet, and of course, I'm pointing you to the ultimate prophet, the one that all prophets in the Old Testament and priests and kings point to, Jesus, the ultimate revealer, who did the great deed, who can give you what the world can't give you. And I want you to know, if in New York City, you believe that what I'm telling you today you'll be a lot like Naaman because when Naaman took the word of a little slave girl from the wrong side of the tracks and acted on it, when all the elites, when all the powerful people in the world said, that's ridiculous. If you believe the gospel in New York City, it's like listening to that little slave girl because all the elites, all the smart people say it's ridiculous. This idea that you have to be washed in the blood of Jesus. But I would tell you, listen to her, listen to her. It's the truth. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, some of us are seeking, and we pray you'd bring us home. All of us are in different places here with regard to this subject, and I ask that you would make what your son did so real to us now as we take the bread and the cup that the, uh, the grace of Jesus Christ would, be, would come home to our hearts, regardless of where we are. We pray that you make it a reality now. Through Jesus Christ, we ask it. Amen. Thank you for listening today. Gospel and Life's ministry is supported by generous partners all over the world. Your gifts allow us to share the gospel message with millions of people through our podcast, radio, and other channels, including here on YouTube. We're seeing God change lives through the increasing reach of this ministry, so thank you for your part in it. If you'd like to make a gift today, go to gospelandlife.com slash YouTube, and we'll send you one of my books as thanks for your gift. Thank you again for your generous support, because the gospel really does change 
everything.